Hi, and welcome to the STM32 lab, Programming and Debugging the Code for Part 1. In this video, we're going to cover the code for Part 1, as well as how to program it, run it, debug. Now, in this video, I'm going to be using the L432KC board. If you happen to have the F303K8, go ahead and follow along as the steps would be identical between the two boards. So from here, I have my main, I'm in my main.c file with my main function. I'm going to look and as we can see, we've already discussed, we have our different functions that have been auto-generated to how init, system clock config, the GPIO init, as well as the UART. And finally, we have our infinite loop or while one. Now, what we're going to do is in the lab document that was provided, we're going to go ahead and copy and paste some code. And I'm going to place the code inside the user code begin three section. So a helpful hint within the STM32 product line, or I should say the STM32 IDE, they have this functionality of using these user codes. The great thing about this is if you're auto generating the code, if you put your own code that you've written within these user codes, it won't touch it. Now, what I mean by that is if I had placed a file or comment with outside of this user code N2 and before the user code begin while, if I go back and change my pin configuration and generate code, this line, whatever's within it, will get deleted. Now, if I place code like this if, this if statement within this user code begin three here, the code won't disappear. It'll stay, it'll remain there even if I auto-generate, change my pin configuration and everything else. Now, if I change how I use pin three and pin four, it doesn't mean my code will compile, but it just means it won't delete this code. So let's le go ahead and leverage these user code begins and ends within these sections to make sure any changes you make, if you forgot something like a pin change or a pin configuration in later parts of the lab, you won't have to redo some work. So inside of my infinite loop, I copied and pasted this code. So let's go ahead and talk about what this code does. So in this code, I have an if statement that is going to check the state of a pin. This pin is PB3. And we can tell by the fact that we're using GPL port B, pin three. So it's going to read the state if it's reading a high or low signal from that pin. If it is, it's going to go ahead and write to PB4 a high signal, which is GPIO pin set. If it's not, it's going to go ahead and write a low signal or make sure we're writing the pin to be zero. Now, the other thing you'll notice is I included a delay. So this delay will just ensure that our code is working properly as some functions might, or some backend processes might require a small amount of time to do some things. So in this case, I'm just gonna add a delay it's not necessary, but it's just sometimes things that we add to microcontroller programs. Now, this delay, I should mention, is running at 100 milliseconds. So as we can see in this function, as I hover over it, it gives me the uh, statement. So whatever we're providing is in milliseconds. All right, so I have my program. I have, if I push my push button, it's going to run and everything's set up. And again, I'm just gonna go through and confirm that my GPIO input, I have my PB3, which should be connected to my push button, and PB4, which should be connected to my LED. Now, after we've done that, we need to build our project. So I'm going to go to project, build project. Excellent. So if you notice this, it'll tell you that it's builds finished. If you have any errors, go in back and check to see what errors there are. And you can usually do that by going to problems and they'll give you a list of warnings and errors that might occur and what line and what the possible cause could be. So there is a couple files that are generated. So one that we notice is there is a .elf file. This is the binary that we're gonna to use to program our board. Additionally, there's a, what's called a .lsi, sorry, .listing file. And this is going to provide us some additional information, which we're going to look at in a second. So this file, the dot list file, is located in the debug here. And I'm going to go ahead and open this up. Now, 
we've discussed going back to the x86 lab we discussed about assembly well the dot listing file is actually the assembly or some of the code that is generated and put into different sections of memory onto our board so here we can actually go through and we can see the the code or this the assembly associated with the c program that we did so if we go through we can see here in the main we have our main file we can see our main function we do there are some code that's set up around the user code begin one. So here, here's that. And we can go through and we actually can look at more detail of what each of these are doing. So we can see what's happening in the if statement. We can see what's happening on the write statement on either one, right? And then as we go down, we can see what each step is doing. So this is great for debugging purposes if we're going through and we've hit a snag, we're not 100% sure what's going on. We can dive deeper into the actual hardware and see what this assembly is being written. Now, this assembly is a little different than the one we covered in x86. Um, as we, we refer to this as RISC, and x86 is a CISC or type of instruction set. So just keep that in mind. But as you go through you'll and you get comfortable with a particular system, you'll tend to understand a little bit both of them well and how to read them and how to use them. But again, for these purposes, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to understand this in great detail. I just want to point out where can we find this information if we need it. So again, it just breaks down and it kind of tells you what each of the functions are, what code or what assembly is being used and where it's located or created within that binary. So going back to my main.c, I've successfully built my project. We've looked at the listing file. Now I'm going to need to do is program my board. So to do this, I'm going to simply go to run and I'm going to select debug configurations. Now, as you see the debug configurations open, I'm going to go ahead and select STM32 Cortex M C C++ application. I'm going to double click and it'll immediately pick up and set up a debug configuration for the setting. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and select debug. And it's going to go ahead and start waiting for the debugger and setting it up and programming it. Now it's going to ask me to change to a debug perspective. So an important thing in the Cube IDE or in Eclipse IDE platforms in general is they have what's called different perspectives. So right now we're in a code configuration perspective. If I, we change to debug, we'll notice that the views on the windows will change. And this is really conducive to what we need to see when we're debugging. Now if I want to change back to the C, C++ and writing and code and developing from a project, this perspective is more useful. But if I'm going to debug, this is far more useful. So first, now that we're debugging our code, what you'll notice is our code, this first line in this HowNet is green. So this simply is because what STM32 does is it sets a breakpoint on the first line of our main function. So because we're running our code, what's called in debug mode, which is a way to figure out if there's issues going on their system, we go ahead and we set a breakpoint here. Now, what I'm going to do is let me go ahead and show you our, uh, show you the, um, the board set up with the circuit that we built. So again, I have my PB3 connected to my push button. PB4 is this yellow wire that's connected to the other end of the LED. So I'm going to go ahead and select this button up here, which is continue. And what you'll see is the green line goes away. So at this point, my code is executing. And what you'll see is I'll come over and I'll push my push button and my LED turns on. If I let go of my push button, my LED is off. And then push it, it turns on. So the advantage of debug is it allows us to figure out what's going within our code. And what that is, is I can set up breakpoints. So currently my code is executing. As you just saw, I pressed my push button. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna set a breakpoint at line 104. And I do this by double clicking that blue line, or I can select and disable breakpoint, enable breakpoint, I can remove the breakpoint, or I right click over that line and I can select add breakpoint. I have a little bit more options as I can choose different things. I'm gonna just select apply and close. So what this does is 
breakpoints allow us to stop execution of code at certain lines. And this is useful, especially in the case of an if statement, because this code should only be executed if GPIO read pin is a high signal or if a push button is being pressed. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So I'm going to go ahead and push my push button with the code executing. And we'll see as that line now turns green. Now, one thing I want to point out, if you look at the top, um, if you look at the pinout, my LED has not turned on. This is because it stops execution, but it has not ran this line. So it has not set that pin to be high yet. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to step over the code. And what should happen when I select this or press, if I press the F6 keyboard is I'm going to go down to line 108. My LED should turn on. And if I continue to step over, I should continue through the loop. And if I don't press my push button, it should actually go down, turn my L it should hit this line, then turn my LED off when it hits here, and then continue. Okay? So let's go ahead and give that a try. So I hit next. You'll see my LED is now on. If I continue to step over my program, it goes back through the loop. So now I'm at the if statement. Now, if I press it again, I'm not pressing, I'm not pushing my push button. So it should go to line 106 here. Now, again, my LED is still on. It still hasn't turned off. As I hit the step over one last time, what you'll see is the LED should now turn off because again, it hasn't executed that code yet. Okay, so now my LED is off and if I continue to hit it. Now, if I wanna continue running my code and not worry about stepping through, I just simply hit the resume or continue. Now I'm gonna remove my push button. And again, my code is back to normal, like so. So the one thing I wanna point out is when we're debugging, we wanna be conscious of where we put our breakpoints. Again, currently we're what's in called an infinite loop. So the code that's always being executed is the if statement, this delay, and most likely because of the condition of our push button, this how write pin. So what I mean by that is if I put a breakpoint at 108, 106, 102, the breakpoint is immediately going to be hit. And if I hit continue, it's always going to be hit because there's no condition where the, those, at least these two pieces of code will ever be hit. And unless the push button is being pressed, which is very often it's not being pressed, then we're gonna hit this line 106 a lot. So let's go ahead and see that. So I'm gonna set a breakpoint at line 108 and you'll almost immediately see the code stop and execute at line 108 like so. So now you see how it's green. If I hit continue, it'll can it'll go back and show me green again at line 108. See? So remember, we want to be conscious of how we set up our breakpoints. It's important that we know that we make get useful information or data. So if I go here and again, I push the push button, now it's hitting my breakpoint. This is also valuable, and I'll point this out, in later parts or more complex parts of labs, when we have variables, if we hit a breakpoint, we can actually read what the state of variables are. And this is great because if we're debugging and we have more complex conditional statements that we need, and we're like, well, why is why are we not going to if statement? We can, we can set up breakpoints at certain points, step through the code, and see what the vac those variables are set to. We can even look at what register values are. And even as the code's running in some systems, we can actually look at live expressions or what the values are as the code is executing. It isn't, not all systems have that capability, but some do. So that's how we're going to debug our system. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit continue. And now if I'm done debugging, I'm simply going to select terminate. Once it's terminated, we're going to go ahead and switch back to the C, C++ perspective. So that's how we debug our code. The last thing I wanna point out is this debugging is not what we normally write code for. It's purely for us to figure out if there's issues or other things as we step through it. Now, purposes of the lab, we can run code through debug, but it's not the normal way that code is being ran. And I say that as if I deliver code to customers, I don't give them debug code. I usually give them code that's ran in a, a release mode or a smaller mode. And how we do that is we simply go to run and we go to run configuration. And here, all we're gonna do is you'll notice is instead of debugging, we're just gonna select run. So it's going to connect. Now it's still waiting for the debugger connection, 
But at this point, the code is simply just downloading to our system with no fancy setup. So now what I do is if I push my push button, you see my LED come on and off, but there's no debug mode. So I can't check the state of variables or any other settings. So that's all that I wanted to cover today for the STM32 lab. I hope that was helpful. If you do have any questions, feel free to ask your lab instructor and have a wonderful day.